Hi there. Welcome and thanks for joining us for another informative weekend edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Theodore Henry. On this half hour journey, we'll be exploring economic development through agribusiness. As usual, we get health wise as we explore good and bad fats in our diet, plus help for disabled children. Sit back and relax for these and more interesting features to inspire you. Agriculture is one of the key industries in our economy. And our first stop on today's journey, we are engaging in a hybrid investment forum on agribusiness development to learn how to invest, grow, and create wealth. If I can get 500 bags of turmeric, how do I get it to America? Jamaica's agriculture sector is gearing up to dig deeper roots through the many opportunities coming out of its first hybrid agribusiness investment forum. The market is open as the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries through the Agro Investment Corporation, AIC, seeks to widen the net of large-scale investments in agriculture. In a race to preserve Jamaica's food security, the sector is being rebranded as more than just a tool for survival. The investment forum featured over 500 participants joining virtually as stakeholders from government, finance, export and regulations shared expertise on the business process of agriculture. Agroinvest will continue to play our part by facilitating the business assets, through matching, one-on-one -on -one dialogue, collating, reviewing, and disseminating a set of bankable projects that would interest investors, promoting a region-wide network for expanding production and distribution, matching agribusiness entrepreneurs wishing to network with potential investors to collaborate on new opportunities in the agri-sector. Over the past two years, the AIC has provided strong support to farmers and investors by writing 300 business plans, putting 2,000 acres of land into production, and connecting producers with exporters by organizing export functions. Now, the AIC is tackling some of the challenges in the agriculture sector by inviting stakeholders to benefit from its myriad of services. The AIC is here to facilitate investments on a large scale in our country. One avenue for AIC investment support is through the agroparks. What is this and how do I get involved, you may ask? An agropark is a parcel of land equipped with the right facilities and services to ensure agricultural production can thrive at all levels of the value chain. Investors are invited to make applications to the AIC for lands in the agroparks, where they are assessed based on the required conditions and then placed. We want to dive into the reality of the several hundreds of acres that our rural, rural women network wants us to tap into so that we can say to Jamaica that there's no longer idle land. But if you see land that is not cultivated, it's because we choose for it to not be cultivated. We have 810 acres that have been allocated to the development of the Mango Agro Park in Tollgate, Clarendon on the former sugarcane lands. We are managing the process and we have attracted over 50 investors and placed already 14 of the 50. We have also spent $120 million developing the property, supporting irrigation, roads and other infrastructure. The vibrancy in Jamaica's agriculture sector is springing up with urgency as the government is cultivating strategic investments. Eight agroparks and nine agricultural production zones is just the start. In the last two years, the AIC has increased the acreage of lands in production from 2,786 to 5,300 acres with more than 500 farmers engaged. To reap the immense benefits from the business of farming, more work is being done to get the right products across the globe. 
We have to play to the food trends in the market, organic, sustainable, superfoods. Look how many of those superfoods we produce in Jamaica. It's extraordinary. Yam, we, yam and sweet potato are much better for you than Irish potato. What are we doing about positioning our products? Adding to this is the regulation and certification of produce for export, which comes with several benefits for the successful agripreneur. We have several bilateral agreements from the regulatory standpoint that already exist, which means we have ready markets for you based on these agreements. And so quite often you don't really need to do much, just have your facilities ready as well as the, um, the produce. It's the composite of putting the business into farming and budding more interest in the sector among the youth. Farming is the future of Jamaica. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO, world food production must increase to 70% by 2050 to feed the global population. And that is why we have scored investment of $120 million on our Holland agroeconomic zone, where factories are being constructed right now to expand agro-processing there. From the growing of our food to ensuring we are eating healthy. Yes, that's how the pages turn. This week, HealthWise is about the benefits of good fats and the dangers of bad fats. The human brain is 60% fat. Fats provide a storehouse of energy for the body and promote normal cell growth and healthy skin. Fat also acts like a cushion and heat regulator to protect the heart, liver, and other vital organs. And as most people would know, fat adds flavor to our food and helps us feel full longer. It is clear that having fat in our diet is beneficial in many ways, but too much or the wrong kind can be equally harmful. Fat is a source of essential fatty acids which help the body absorb vitamins A, D and E. There are three types. Monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids are both considered good fats. The third, saturated fatty acid, is what we are often encouraged to avoid or lower our intake. So too, trans fat, which is created by a process called hydrogenation, that makes the fat harder at room temperature to increase the shelf life. What is in our foods impact on the quality of our lives? The World Health Organization recommends that trans fat intake be limited to less than 1% of total energy intake, which translates to less than 2.2 grams per day with a 2,000 calorie diet. Studies have shown that saturated fat increases the amount of bad cholesterol or LDL in the blood and has no effect on the good cholesterol, HDL. Trans fatty acids increase the amount of bad cholesterol in the blood and also reduce the amount of good cholesterol. Diets high in these bad fats are linked to obesity, heart disease, and other cardiovascular related problems. Trans fat also causes malformation of cell membranes and other cell structures in the body, leading to weak cell walls and abnormal cell function. They are not recognized by enzymes and can cause neural degeneration and diminished brain function. So why then is trans fat used? Well, taste and economics. Trans fat makes food stay fresh on the shelf longer and improves food texture and flavor stability. Based on a 2021 assessment of the fatty acids in commonly consumed foods in Jamaica, or intake is very high. If you look at confectionery, you see how high the percentage is um, there, and uh, it, it comes down in several of the other 
food products. Okay, this is just the percentage that have trans fat. Notice that the canned foods had none at all, or the beverages that we looked at had no trans fat. Okay? Um, but this is just saying whether there was trans fat in the product. What we are even more interested in is which products had high levels of trans fat. In terms of the highest concentrations, more than 2% of fat as trans fat, we see the dairy products and it goes down like that. And then when we now look at those that had the same products that had high saturated fat along with the trans fat, um, we see the figures here. The Ministry of Health and Wellness is looking to change this and encourage better food production and consumption practices. Healthier alternatives can be used that do not affect the taste or the cost of food. Knowing what is in our food is part of the way forward. It is a lifestyle change to come through education, product reformulation, regulation, food labeling and monitoring. The elimination of industrially produced trans fats is, a, is part of a comprehensive policy package to prevent diet-related NCDs, which comprises mandatory food labeling, ingredients list, nutrition panels declaring trans fats interpretive, front of package labeling based on nutrient profiles, restrictions on food marketing aimed at children and adolescents, mandatory standards for healthy food served in schools, and limits on sugar content. It's not just about our resolve to do the right thing to consume what is in our best interest. That in and of itself is a challenge because we have to now nudge, encourage, motivate, and in some instances legislate, I believe, certain types of actions to, to encourage better quality of life from a nutrition consumption standpoint. I think it is essential to advocating in the first instance for voluntary compliance as an immediate response. As consumers, we have the choice of using naturally occurring unhydrogenated vegetable oils such as canola, safflower, sunflower or olive oil. We can also limit red meat and choose lean cuts. It is also recommended that we steam, boil or bake foods instead of cooking them in fats or oils. Another approach is to choose low-fat dairy products, poultry and fish, and purchase processed foods made with unhydrogenated oils rather than partially or hydrogenated vegetable oils or saturated fats. Use soft margarines as a substitute for butter and choose soft margarine over the harder stick forms. Limit consumption of commercially fried foods and baked goods made with shortening or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Not only are these high in fat, but it is also likely to be trans fat. And cut back on foods high in dietary cholesterol. Let's eat healthy and live well. We're still on the healthy path, but now we're exploring spasticity. It's a condition that manifests with muscles and joint deformities, causing muscle stiffness and disability, where movement is less precise and certain tasks become difficult to perform. Up next, we see how this affects children and the possibilities for treatment. A mother or father's wish for his or her child. That he or she is happy, healthy, able, and will achieve his or her full potential. Even in the face of disabilities, these aspirations are affirmed with extra care and the outpouring of love in support of children with special needs. And the children themselves, some not able to freely move due to a condition known as spasticity, have strong faith in their abilities. 
Spasticity or muscle toning is a type of muscle stiffness seen in children with neurological conditions such as cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a name that describes a group of condition where there's injury to the brain, the developing brain that occurs during pregnancy, in utero, at the time of delivery, or up until three years old. And it affects a part of the brain that controls movement, the motor section. With the varying degrees of cerebral palsy, some children may have issues with comprehension or understanding. Others have seizures and problems talking, swallowing, hearing, or seeing. Despite the struggles, the possibilities are bright for children living in Jamaica with this and other conditions that affect the ability to walk. Medical interventions are now allowing some disabled children to walk for the first time and for others to walk better, ultimately having an improved quality of life. I think what we have brought is a comprehensive approach to addressing the problem um, where all the medical professionals, including nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, um, the surgeons, the rehabilitation and specialists and physiatrists, um, and the neurosurgeons and neurologists have come together um, working with the hospital, working with the pharmacists to try and solve the problems of each child individually. So it's not a one size fit all. So for example, in my specialties, some of them may need a surgical procedure on the lower back which we call a dorsal rhizotomy, where we will um, resect some of the nerve or divide some of the nerves to allow them to move the legs more freely. Other options for treatment include injecting the muscles or around the nerves with medication that decrease muscle tone or muscle stiffness. These medications include phenol or botulinum toxin type A, Botox. Specialist teams at the Bustamante Hospital for Children and the University Hospital of the West Indies, along with partners from overseas, have been pioneering treatments for these children. The children are assessed. They're assessed by the physiatrists, um, they're assessed by the physiotherapists, and a diagnosis is made, and then a particular treatment is prescribed that's tailor made for that child's disability. Assistive aids such as braces, walkers and other orthotic devices provide important support to children dealing with spasticity and the pain or discomfort it causes. It's important for children with movement problems to be positioned properly. Without good positioning, the stiffness can pull the joints out of alignment and so when they're very early, we put them in what we call braces or orthotics and these orthotics will maintain a proper alignment of the joint, preventing the ankles from being deformed, preventing the fingers from de being deformed. The braces help with standing, balance, and overall mobility. If you start from toe upwards, you have what we call ankle foot orthosis, AFO is the quick acronym. You have orthosis or braces that includes the knee, ankle foot orthosis that allows for stability. You have some that we use at the hip to keep the hip apart. We use some at the elbows as well or the wrists, the wrist orthosis. Some patients may require spine orthosis. Those are not usually used in the neuromuscular children, meaning the children with cerebral palsy and weakness. And if they are able to stand and balance, they get walkers to ambulate or wheelchairs so the parents and care caregivers can carry them around comfortably. There are several risk factors for cerebral palsy. The risk factors include poor um, antenatal care. It also includes children that are born very young, premature delivery, less than 28 weeks because the brain is very very um, delicate and any changes in oxygenation can affect the brain. Low birth weight as well when children are born very low. Uh, you know, different types of infections can cause it. And even after delivery, there's the risk from head injury and infections such as meningitis and jaundice, among other things. Doctors say the risk of developing cerebral palsy can be minimized. Parents need to know that you must have proper antenatal care, proper enough to take the, the pregnancy to full term to 40 weeks so the child's brain and body and blood vessels can develop properly. Uh, in addition to that, good health care condition for the mother and delivery, you know, uh, safe delivery is always important and uh, postnatally, meaning after they're delivered, 
is to ensure that the children are healthy, they get their vaccinations, they're not exposed to any infection, there's no trauma to the brain, uh, environment is safe so you don't have exposure to chemicals that can also cause it or to accidents or near drowning and stuff like that. Children's exposure to toxic chemicals such as paints with lead in them, herbicides, pesticides or household chemicals with pungent odors, either ingested or inhaled, can cause brain damage and must be avoided. Our best option for good health is always prevention. But that aside, effective curative measures offer hope and great joy. We do have children walking who weren't able to walk before. We do have children sitting who couldn't sit before. I had a patient once where the legs were crossed, scissors, scissor do we call it, where the legs were scissors at the hips and the mother wasn't able to clean her properly or carry her. So when she used to carry, she used to carry her in the front. So we injected between the legs and she came out. She was very happy. I'm like, why are you so happy? She's like, me can lap her now. I said, what do you mean by that? Because we injected between the legs, she could open the legs so she could now carry her on the side, one foot in the front, one in the back, and the bag. We hear of another story from Aunt Avia, who cares for her nephew, Emilio. His name is Emilio Morris. He's 12 years old. At one point, his foot was like turning like this. So now the car sit at the Bustamante, it said come back around straight. So now he's wearing our braces. At one point he used to creep, but now he doesn't creep. At one point his knee was very tight, but now it's not so tight. Things kind of better now, being that he get an injection, he used to get fizzy. They want him to stand up in the brace. Kenil Baker is 13 years old. He was born with cerebral palsy low motor skills. Basically, he cannot walk without assistance. We have been coming to this clinic for some time now where he has gotten injections and has done a surgery, which has helped him tremendously. He could not lay on his stomach. After this, the surgery, he was able to lay on his stomach and turn over, roll over. He's able to stretch out his, his hands and legs. And for bathing him, it has, been, it has been made much easier for caring for him. He could not feed himself. He's trying to feed himself now. Well, you can leave him with food and he will feed himself. He's a very happy child. And we have good support from family and friends and thank God we do. He's our joy. He's our joy. We are all immersed in an evolving digital world that is revolutionizing how we interact and conduct our daily activities, including the business of education. Our classrooms have become more and more virtual over the past years, and the government pledges to continue this technological transformation. Learn more in this next feature. of a global technological revolution, the fourth industrial revolution that is transforming the way we access information, communicate, learn, and even play. The COVID-19 pandemic quickly demonstrated why the need to integrate technology in education is a vital part of teaching and learning. But this should not be done exclusively as a crisis management tool because technology is now an indispensable part of modern life. The Jamaican government understands and is moving in alignment with that idea. Technology will remain a permanent part of the education system. Um, we will still have all the technology that you are used to in the virtual space. It will still be available. World Economic Forum in its Future of Jobs report estimated that by 2025, 85 million jobs may be displaced by technology. However, the report also estimates that 97 million new jobs will emerge that are more adapted to the new division of labor between humans 
machines and algorithms. Technology is the future, and the future is digital. It simply means that using technology in the classroom will help to prepare our children to become more competitive applicants for future job markets. By incorporating devices such as interactive smart boards, using smart computer labs or apps such as Google Classroom into the daily teaching and learning environment, students are better prepared for the digital marketplace. While we work to address the learning loss from the pandemic, we are concurrently embarking on a systemic transformation of our education system to address three fundamental issues. The first is the quality of education and alignment with future job markets. The walls of the classrooms are no longer barriers to collaborative work as technology is facilitating new ways of communicating and working together. Where interaction was once limited to those in physical proximity, now technology is facilitating students in one class being able to easily share information with teachers and their peers in other locations near and far. Even for work outside class, students can collaborate on group projects using technology-based tools and applications, allowing for easier peer interaction and engagement. We are in the era of artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality. This Revolution is transforming the way children and young people access information. It's now easy for students and teachers to access a vast amount of information, from books to research papers to videos, available through just a click on the internet. Opportunities too for formal learning are available online, giving people the chance to participate in and complete traditional degree programs at institutions even in other countries. With the ease at which people can now access education, it therefore means that learning too can be accelerated and students can explore new subjects and deepen their understanding of difficult concepts. With the global reach of the internet, a new epoch of any time, anywhere is emerging for the education field. The use of technology in education could very well mean that learning no longer has to be confined to regular firm school hours. Simply put, engage in your lessons at times most convenient to you. The education sector, like many others, has become deeply intertwined with technology, but the promise of greater development rests in what educators, students, and even technological developers do to support learning and teaching needs. Well, for us here in Jamaica. This government is transforming our education system and sowing seeds for peace, opportunity. And that's all for Jamaica Magazine today. Be sure to join us tomorrow for another show. Until then, there's more to watch on our YouTube channel and our website, which you can find at jis.gov.jm. Also, check out all the major social media platforms and our mobile app that's both Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire production team, I'm Theodore Henry. Till next time, take care and keep safe. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.